grand menu. You notice I said this was for out-of-town visitors. But if you contribute food, then we hope you will stay and visit with them. As I said, it's an experiment. We have no, no idea of how many guests we are going to have from week to week. Some Sabbaths, we may throw a party and nobody comes. At other times, we hope we have enough food for them. But when we do have guests, particularly those who prefer not to eat in a restaurant on Sabbath, we would like to make them welcome and share a Sabbath meal with them and hear their stories. So if you think this is a ministry for you that you'd like to help with, see me after church. I'm going to be up here in the front. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, let's see. Carrie. Well, I just want to make sure that you all notice in your bulletin that the celebration of our graduates is going to happen June 23rd. It was a previous date before, and I don't remember, but it got changed to June 23rd this week. And if you have someone who is graduating in your family or you know of someone that's graduating, also notice in that um, blurb in the bulletin that there is a place to download the form to send in so we can be sure that they're included in our celebration of our graduates this year. Thanks. All right. Um, Brian, come on up. And while you're coming, I just want to point out that the Green Lake softball team has its first game tomorrow afternoon. And we need thousands of people to be in the stands to cheer them on. So if you would like to be one of the thousands of people, um, the information's in your bulletin, the location, the time. Uh, but tomorrow, I mean the beginning of the season, it's not every day that you get to go to opening season of the Green Lake softball team. And uh, this, this is a, a, the, you know, a social event of the year not to be missed. So tomorrow afternoon, 5 p.m., Laurelhurst Park. Uh, be there. Otherwise, Ken might be mad at you. So come on, Brian. Let's, let's, we've got to recruit these people, right? I know. I know we do. Man. Um, well, tell them what we're going to recruit yeah. for, and then I'm going to back you up and say, y'all be there. All right, so okay? Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. All right. Happy Sabbath. And I know you've seen me up here before. Uh, I am just here to plug our, our Vacation Bible School program again. It's going to be third week of July, July 16 to 20, and it's going to be in the evening, 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Uh, I will be in the back after church with a sign-up sheet again if you'd like to have your kids attend or if you would like to help us volunteer. Uh, volunteer. We still have a few spaces or several spaces we'd like to fill uh, if you want to use your creativity and help us with decorations or if you'd like to lead out in a craft or even just assist in a craft or help out with food. There's plenty of um, talents we could utilize to make the VBS program successful. So I will be in the back and also if you are already volunteering, if you've signed up to volunteer, we're going to hold a quick meeting after church, probably five to ten minutes at most, uh, up in the kindergarten room upstairs. So. We'd love to see you there, and looking forward to having your children come during the summer and uh, learn more about Jesus and get creative and be part of our hands-on program. Uh, the theme is called Cave Quest, and it's kind of a cave theme, finding Jesus, or Jesus is the light of the world, and each day we have a different theme that supports that, and we do hands-on kind of science activities that support that theme. So looking forward to having your kids there and having seen a lot of adults uh, there as well. You're going to be at the table, and you're going to yes. be in the kindergarten room. I'll be in both places. Yeah, yeah, both both places, places at the same time. Yeah. No, two separate. I'll be at the back at the table, and once everyone files out, I'll go upstairs, and we're going to be having a quick meeting up there. Okay, so we want people who've already signed up to beat you to the kindergarten room. Yes. Be in the kindergarten yeah. room wondering yeah. where you are. Yes. Come on, what, what's Brian doing while he's down recruiting? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. All good. right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. I really appreciate your work on that. Um, in your bulletin, there is an announcement down about 
Two-thirds of the way on the announcement page, it says, thanks to you, hunger stops here. Um, we are collecting food for Northwest Harvest. Right now, the shelves are kind of empty there, and they're looking for some special help. So if you can help in that area, please take note of that uh, announcement. There are boxes out in the hall where you can deposit food. Uh, Hans is not here today. He's back in New York. Hans, I hope you're watching on live stream. You better be. Um, he's excited to be back visiting family in New York, and uh, he'll be back next week. And finally, uh, a program note for the service. At the end of the service, ordinarily, after I pronounce the benediction, the choir then sings a benediction, and the congregation remains standing during that sung benediction. The choral benediction today is uh, extra long. Uh, it's not a, the usual brief piece. And so when I am finished pronouncing the benediction, I'll invite you to be seated, and uh, you can sit for the choral benediction and then for the uh, brief choral concert, which will follow um, as our postlude today. So now I invite you to stand, greet one another, pass God's peace here in God's house. I'll invite you to find your seats. Here at Green Lake Church, music is a big deal. In fact, music's a big deal in every church. I've never been to a church that music wasn't a big deal. But if anything, it's a bigger deal among us. It's something really special for us. And, and one of the elements that for us uh, is special is our choir. Um, pretty much patterning on the school year, the choir's in the loft nearly every week. And this is their last week in the loft for a while. They take the summer off, except for a Sabbath in July. And so today is our choir festival, and there will be extra music today. And the junior choir, I think this is your concluding performance for this season, is that right? And we're going to miss you in the summer. You'll be here, but thank you so much for all that you do to make our, our worship special. And choir, Green Lake Singers, let's, let's use the proper name, Green Lake Singers, thank you for what you do to uh, make our worship special, to lift our hearts. You do for us what we could not do for ourselves, many of us. So thank you so much. And Wanda, uh, you, thank you for your leadership. Appreciate uh, all that you do to help make this happen. 
And so now I invite you to open your hearts as the choir calls us into worship. Almighty Creator, 
thank you for this day. Thank you for this place. Thank you for calling us into your presence and receiving us with your smile. Lord of the cosmos, we pray that you will hasten the day when all things far and near are ordered according to your good pleasure. Lord of the nations, make it soon when swords are beaten into plowshares and spears are turned into pruning hooks and justice rolls down like the great river. Lord of our hearts, so mold and shape us that we may act as agents of your kingdom to bring peace and justice to cooperate with you in your love is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Growing up in the Adventist church, we were so blessed to enjoy the benefits of community. Church was the center of our universe in that tiny little town of Morton. When I look back on how my love for community was developed because of this small, dedicated congregation, I marvel at what the opportunities church provided. My sister and I were the first of five to attend the Morton Adventist School. A few years later, we were headed to Oshkosh for Pathfinder Camporee all because of our generous congregation. My parents were very involved in that little church. They served as elders, deacons, they were the maintenance crew, they helped build the school, they were the treasurer, but every week they found time to host Sabbath lunch. Through their leadership, they taught us the importance of the financial gifts. We knew that at a very early age, giving meant serving and tithing. Belonging, that's what church is. It's the immeasurable benefits that Sabbath brings where the spiritual, the intellectual, the physical, and the mental needs of our souls are met. But church is also a business. The judicial planning and the budgeting of the funds so generously giving, given by each congregational member, allowing for these meaningful interactions. My first introduction to understanding all of this was during my early years here at Green Lake. I was a freshman in college, and I was incredibly blessed to be part of one of the most tight-knit collegiate groups in the country. Many a Sabbath afternoon was spent at the home of Chuck and Carol Keith with those amazing people that are still to this day very good friends. But I knew I wanted to give back, so after careful thought, my friend Lori and I decided we wanted to create a space for kids that was their own during Sabbath mornings. At that time, there was a handful of juniors, and I mean a handful of juniors, maybe five. Um, and that was the only Sabbath school class here at this church for children. And we had been asked to teach juniors, and we were all in. That meant we needed money for programming, and we decided to take our request to the board. The request was very minimal financially, but, it created great dialogue at the board meeting, and the questions during that meeting were very well thought out, but Don Mayer advocated for us faithfully in the way only Don Mayer can do. But in the end, our plan was approved with a unanimous yes. Why is this important? I tell you these stories to illustrate the passion of volunteers who use their expertise in building community for the business of church. It is the beautiful thing about community, and it is to remind us that stewardship and financial giving is part of our foundation. I have been so blessed by the incredible thought leaders and the visionaries here at Green Lake who have set into motion the future of this community. When you give to the church budget, your offerings are supporting the children, the youth, the aging, where the physical, the mental, and the spiritual are all met for those who come through the doors. We thank you for your gifts. Will the deacons please stand? Please pray with me. Father in heaven, thank you for this congregation, for the community, and we ask for special blessing on these offerings and these funds that will further your work and bring this community closer together. We pray this in your name. Amen.
Good morning. I am delighted that the junior choir is making its final performance of the season as part of this choral festival. At this time, thanks are in order. First, to this amazing group of young people in the front rows who brighten my Sabbath morning on a weekly basis and bring smiles and I know sometimes tears to your faces as they present music in the sanctuary. Second, to their supportive parents who value music as a significant part of life and especially of worship. Third, to our versatile accompanist, Lisey Case, who brightens my day as she appears each week well prepared for rehearsal. Fourth, to the most unlikely member of the Green Lake Junior Choir. That distinction belongs to Ken Case, who, in case you did not know, usually spends 9.30 to 10 o'clock on Sabbath mornings in the primary room as the most experienced vocalist of the junior choir. He comes to rehearsal because he understands the challenges a boy faces when he suddenly stops being a soprano and becomes a bass. At least half of you maybe could relate to that. And now, Ken is the lead singer of the junior choir bass section. <laughs> Francisco, you know that guy that got really tall really fast? Yeah. And Sam, likewise, are very grateful. So Ken, would you please stand up so we can applaud what you do? We will welcome other um, adults who would like to have a real blast on Sabbath morning. And now, to the music. Today the junior choir members are not singing. They are ringing. And why are they ringing? Because today you, the largest choir of this choral festival, you are singing. And the junior choir singers will accompany you with handbells. But you say, we are not prepared. Not to worry. I know that you are extremely fast learners. So here we go. The junior, now you, the lyrics are in your program. You understand that? And I think you can probably read the English and work with that. The junior choir is going to teach you the tune. So the junior choir will sing it for you one time. Notice that we can sing and also ring. And after you have heard them sing it one time, I'd like to have you join us. Now, since this is the biggest choir in the church, we need the very best director. And so Wanda will be the director of this choir. Now, you have to learn really fast. We're only going to practice it one time.
now we're going to, we are going to accompany you. It's a pretty long introduction, but I made it that way so that the parents can figure out when their child comes in, all right? And I think that you will enjoy that. And then Wanda will tell you when it's time to do it. I think they're going to do great. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. Good morning, boys and girls. I have my box of props here. So I got some things to show you and you're gonna tell, see if you know what they are, okay? We're gonna start easy. So what's that? A hammer, a hammer. okay. They get harder. Uh, how about, what's this? So everybody recognizes a saw, okay. Even though nowadays we use skill saws or table saws, or a whole bunch of saws that you hope your neighbor owns. And, um, but we still use these sometimes. But all those other saws, 
they have to be plugged into electricity. So you need power. So these don't. You just use them. You don't have to use electricity. So a little harder. What's this thing? A drill. How do you know that? Oh, it must be the drill head. Yeah. So instead of electric drill where you and you drill the holes, this one you have to turn it around like that to drill the hole. A lot harder. Yeah. So let's see. What do you think this is? It's a piece of wood. What does it do? So nowadays, when you measure something, you use a tape measure like that. But before somebody invented this little spring here, we used these. See? And then you measure something, and then you just refold it, not nearly as easy as that tape measure, but that's what we, they use to measure things. Okay, how about this? This is a little harder, a lot harder. This they call it a plane. So you run it along the wood and it would make it smooth and make it thinner. So you could remove wood with this and it would make it a lot smoother. Okay, two more. Now what's this? Looks like something that takes a cork, that takes a screw out of a bottle, a clamp. I don't actually know what it is. I was hoping you could help me with that. <laughs> but maybe it's a clamp. Okay, so it's a clamp. That's a good guess. And finally, look at this. This is really cool. It's got these, and this goes up and down when you push this, and it has something back here, and it adjusts the height. And it's something here, you could maybe tie some string to it. Isn't that cool? Any idea what it is? Yeah. A locker, could be. It could be that makes fire. Actually, I have no idea what this is. Absolutely no idea. It's pretty cool, though, but I have no idea what it is. So, these are all very old tools from before we had power available. And who, what kind of people would use those? Who would use those tools? Yeah. A long time ago, yes. No, not necessarily poor people. Some of these cost a lot of money, yes. Lumberjacks, lumberjacks you're close. Not quite lumberjacks. Carpenters. Carpenters. People that built things out of wood use those. So why do I have these tools? My father gave them to me, and his father gave them to him because his father was a carpenter. My grandfather was a carpenter. So why would that be relevant to a story during a church service? Why, did, why would it be relevant that my grandfather was a carpenter? Can anybody guess? Anybody know why that would be of interest? I'll tell you why. Jesus was a carpenter. And his father was a carpenter. He was a carpenter probably using tools very similar to that because it was before there was power. So until he was 30, he was a carpenter using tools like that. So why would God have the Son of God be a carpenter? He could be a rabbi. He could be a prince. He could be a hedge fund manager. He could be all kinds of stuff. Why was he a carpenter? Well, because being a carpenter, he got to work with the regular people. He got to know how to communicate with them. Because when he told parables describing the kingdom of God, he would use everyday examples so that the people could understand. 
Uh, and he used a lot of examples of agriculture, and he also used examples of carpentry and building things. So that's a good, and also he could communicate with the regular people because he knew uh, their lives. You know, there's another reason. My grandfather fixed a lot of things. He used those tools to fix things when they broke, if they were wooden. And Jesus fixes things. He fixes broken people. Using the power of God, he's able to fix people when they're broken. Another thing, my grandfather built a lot of things. Believe it or not, with those tools, he built lots of houses, start to finish by himself, including the house that my father grew up in. My grandfather built that whole house from beginning to end using those tools. And Jesus built. He built a lot of things. In fact, Jesus built everything. And that's our story for today. Thanks, boys and girls. Get your buckets. And we're uh, collecting money for Priya, a ministry in India and a school. Thank you. I'm sorry, uh, kids, if anybody wants any of this stuff, just talk to your parents and, uh, yeah, we'll be.
Eternal God, we come to you this morning from our week of work, from our week of learning, but most of all, we come to rest. To rest on this Sabbath day together in this church community. Some of us have heavy hearts. We are saddened by the news this week, the tragedies that are happening around this world. And Lord, we just pray for comfort. We pray for peace. And Lord, we just need to trust on you. Lord, we pray for this service today and the beautiful music and the children, the choir. And we just thank you for this opportunity to sit at your feet and learn. We pray for Pastor John as he brings us this word that our hearts will be touched, that our minds will be opened, that we will go forth this week empowered to spread your word. Bless us each one. We pray this in your name. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heaven. Praise him for his mighty works. Praise him his praise his unequaled greatness. Praise him with a blast of the ram's horn. Praise him with the lyre and the harp. Praise him with the tambourine and dancing. Praise him with strings and flutes. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Praise him with loud clanging cymbals. Let everything that breathes sing praises to the Lord. Praise the Lord.
The New Testament reading is from Luke 15, 17 through 27. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to his servants, Quick, bring the finest robes in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for the son of mine was dead, and now he has returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word. I spent part of my vacation looking for evidences of life in rocks. And rock is not the ordinary place for life. I think we think of life as if where there's dirt and water and air. But we were looking in the rocks for evidences of life. And there were these little tracks going all over this rocky surface. Oh my God. That critter was alive because it was walking. And some of them were, had footprints that big. And some had footprints smaller than my smallest fingernail. But they were skittering around, walking around. They were alive. I 
evidence of Christian life. If you were going to go look and see if you could find out, was there a Christian in the place? What would you look for? Now you could think of the, the, ethical acts of, the ethical acts and compassionate acts that kind of would, you could write a nice story about. Helping the poor, um, telling the truth, doing things like that. But today I want to focus on another evidence of life. Singing. If there's a Christian in the house, there's going to be music. I put a little post on Facebook earlier in the week. I said, I talked about some, some of the sounds that have touched my life and then invited people to share with me what music stirred their soul. And I got a bunch of responses. And then in the Wednesday email that Nola Jean sent out, I invited the congregation. I said, tell me about music that stirs your soul. And you know, gave some broad hints that I was thinking of music in the conventional sense and also in the, in the broader sense of sound. Ah, oh, and I got the most fantastic responses. I'm going to put a bunch of them in the Gazette because it's more than we could share here in church. But some that I just have to share with you. Karen Baker. She wrote, There was always music growing up. Singing, piano, other instruments. There is something so powerful in literally sharing breath and space together. Sometimes goosebumps and or tears come in the midst of a choir singing Randall Thompson's Alleluia, surrounded by all the parts. Then there was the sacredness of a hot summer evening in Texas at an outdoor pop concert when the third encore piece, must have been a good group, they were having a good evening, I guess. The third encore piece was Be Thou My Vision. The band walked off in the middle of the song, leaving everyone finishing the piece a cappella, and then leaving in silence through the dark, as we all acknowledge the holiness of our shared space and song. Sounds like a magic evening, doesn't it? Some other favorites, she said. The sound of rain on a tent. Sharing the dawn with the chorus of birds at Abel Tasman Park in New Zealand. Haven't been there. Bagpipes scurling through the hills on my first day living in Scotland. Now that would be pretty cool, wouldn't it? or sitting at a pebble beach, enjoying the rhythm of the waves crashing, followed by the light percussion of small stones being pulled back into the ocean. And of course, the grunts and coos of a newborn. Two or three people mentioned this, this baby noise. Ah, oh, yeah, magic music. Sharon Roberts wrote and apologized for, you know, she said, I'm going to give you more than you asked for. And I read her piece. I said, no, that's not what I, that's not more than I was asking for. That's exactly what I was asking for. Listen to this. My first clear memory of music is listening to my father and his quartet practice barbershop, barbershop harmony in our home. Goodbye, my Coney Island baby is running through my memory now. This is a little funny, too, because her dad was a preacher. Um, Friday evening meant fruit soup on toast to the soundtrack of George Beverly Shea and more quartet music from the Blackwood Brothers on the stereo. How many of you remember the Blackwood Brothers? Yeah, a few of you are old enough for that. <laughs> All right. Ezekiel saw a wheel way up in the middle of the air and a little wheel run by faith and a big wheel run by the grace of God. Yeah. Sharon continues, my mother shared her love of musical theater, playing her prized cast recordings of Porgy and Bess and Showboat. 
I discovered Classical King FM. For those of you online, this is a Seattle reference. I discovered Classical King FM when I was in middle school and soaring operas became part of my internal soundtrack, along with the folk and rock music I listened to on KJR on my little transistor radio. Then at Auburn Academy, I fell in love with a boy with curly red hair who could play the piano like nobody else. And then she said about corrupting him. Um, she said, I said about introducing this classical boy to all the music that I loved. For most of 43 years, date night for the two of us has involved music more often than not. 20 years ago, I added hearing my daughter sing at church. So give me church music, classical, gypsy jazz, rock, folk, new age, Celtic reels, opera, show tunes. There is room for all of it, right along with bird song and the ocean roar. And my guess from reading the responses that I got, that if we you know, went around to each of you and said, talk to me about the music that stirs your soul, pieces of this would come out again and again and again. My guess is that nearly all of us would be able to answer that question. Some of us, music is, music is who we are. For others of us, it's not quite that deep, but still it touches us. My friend Bert Williams wrote the symphony. And because of some previous comments, he was wanting to make clear that, in this case, he was talking about a, can I say, a real symphony, as opposed to, you know, ocean and thunder and birdsong and all of that. You know, he says, the symphony, you know, the one on a stage with violins and cellos and French horns and trombones and harps and timpani. Most recently, the San Francisco Symphony offering up the planets by Gustav Holtz. It concluded with a wordless women's chorus completing the final movement a cappella from the lobby of the second tier of Davies Hall, finally evaporating into total silence. And then an entirely different take on music. Still Bert Williams writing, or the time on Highway 6, a hundred miles west of Ely, Nevada, when I stopped to attend to a personal matter and discovered, outside the car, that there was simply no sound. No vehicles, no jets overhead, no birds, no insects, no breeze in the sagebrush, just nothing. Psalm 104 begins with, Bless the Lord, O my soul. And then he begins to talk about why his soul is going to bless the Lord. You are dressed in a robe of light. You stretch out the starry curtain of the heavens. You lay out the rafters of your home in the rain clouds. You make the clouds your chariot. You ride upon the wings of the wind. Can you picture it? Have you watched grand sky shows with clouds and sweeping storms? Maybe in the Midwest punctuated by thunder that it stirs your soul. You clothe the earth with floods of water, water that covered even the mountains. At your command, the water fled. At the sound of your thunder, it turned away. Mountains rose and valleys sank to the levels you decreed. And as I was reading this, I was thinking about the videos from Hawaii this week about land being born there in the middle of the ocean. When the prophets look forward and they dream the dreams of God, they see a world so perfect that injustice cannot be found, 
hunger and hurt disappear. Everything is just as it should be. And Isaiah, looking forward to that that ultimate fulfillment of the kingdom of God, imagining how the world will respond to that beautiful reality. He writes, You will live in joy and peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song. All right, choir. You think you can keep up with that? You're going to have to really sing loud. The mountains and hills will burst into song. The trees of the field will clap their hands. Yeah. Our music and the music of the spheres will become one grand symphony. No wonder we sing already in anticipation of that day. We come to the end of the Bible, to the book of Revelation. In chapter 4, you have a picture of the throne room and all the, all the beings of heaven are making music. And apparently, let's see, I think it would be called antiphonal music because the description is the, the beasts do one thing and then the elders answer. Is that antiphonal, no Wanda? Am I getting... <laughs> But all of heaven is caught up in making music because of the goodness of God, a goodness which they know will not remain in heaven and will not remain in God, but will pervade this world as well. As Adventists, we have been keen theologians. We we cut our teeth as a denomination on the debate stage, arguing with other Christians, proving that our theology was exactly right, exactly correct. And then once we'd vanquished our enemies, then we turned on each other and debated each other to death. It seems to me that it may be time for us as the denomination to move a bit beyond the theological debate, the words about God, about things that pertain to God, and let our musicians take us closer to the truth. Even the most sectarian Adventist, those who insist we should only read books that we have written, when it comes to music, find their hearts naturally opened. And we can all sing Handel's Hallelujah Messiah. No, Handel's Hallelujah Chorus, excuse me. So choir, thank you for leading us through the school year. We're going to miss you when you're out of the loft. But it'll just quicken our hunger for fall to get here and for you to come back. Thank you. It takes work for you to do what you do. And many people here can sing. You have brought your skills and gifts and dedicated them here and have lifted our hearts. You have helped us do what the Bible says. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. You've helped us do that. Thank you. And Wanda... As the choir leader, thank you. I was going to get cut flowers, but I didn't. Instead, I got these. You can just stay right there and look at them. They're real pretty. I heard you have hummingbirds visiting your house. And somehow, when I think of hummingbirds, I think of hanging baskets of flowers. So I hope you have a place to hang it. And I hope you'll remember our thanks as you see it. Um, Thank you. And Shelly, thank you. And Junior Choir, thank you. And Karen and the Cherub Choir, thank you. And Alex and the orchestra, wow. To the musicians in this church who lift our hearts, who help us as a community to do better what every living Christian, what every living Christian does, which is make noise to God, 
to all of you, thank you. Psalm 150 in the New Living Bible says, ends with, let everything that lives praise the Lord. That's an okay translation, but I think I like the, 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 the more precise translation because it somehow captures what happens when we sing, let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated.